Thanks all for coming, uh, especially if you're not just sheltering from the rain. I think it stopped, so now is your chance. Um, all right, so uh, I'm here to talk about Zen and its uh, relationship with Debian. Um, before we get into that, I thought maybe I would just give a, a brief history of Zen and sort of talk about its architecture and define some of the uh, terminology that I'm going to be using. Uh, so Zen spun out of the Xeno Servers project, which was a research project at the University of Cambridge. Um, and uh, they tell you not to read off the slide, but this is, this is from their, uh, uh, the, the research project webpage. So the Xeno Server project is building a public infrastructure for wide area distributed computing. We envisage a world in which Xeno Server execution platforms will be scattered across the globe and available for any member of the public to submit code for execution. Right, and so it was spun out into a separate project. Um, version 1.0 was in uh, late 2003. Um, they went fairly quickly to 2.0, a bit sort of a major re-architecting. Uh, and then again, another major re-architecting, we had version 3 uh, towards the end of 2005. Uh, and that's the architecture which we still use today. We've, we've gone past 4.0, but the, the compatibility and the architecture remain the same. Um, currently, we're at Zen 4.1, um, and we're currently frozen for 4.2. Um, so some basic Zen concepts. Um, Zen is essentially uh, what we call a type 1 hypervisor. It means it runs uh, directly on the hardware, uh, as opposed to a type 2 hypervisor, which would run in a, a host operating system. Um, now, there's a little bit of a twist with Zen. It's not quite exactly a type 1, um, because uh, rather than having all the device drivers and what have you in the hypervisor itself, what we do is we have one or more privileged domains which are able to uh, see the hardware. Uh, and so you run your drivers in those and, they, and use those to provide services to actual guest VMs. So typically, in a normal uh, Zen system, you have one such privileged domain, which we call domain zero or DOM zero. And this is the first domain which is loaded on boot, and it contains you know, all your NIC drivers and your storage drivers and uh, tool stacks and host console access and things like that. Um, and obviously, as well as the, the control domains, we have you know, your actual guests, which is where your, your customers or your users can run their workloads and things. Um, but the, one of the uh, interesting things about Zen's architecture is that you can actually split up this privileged domain, and you can take services out of it uh, into uh, a variety of different types of service domains, driver domains, subdomains, little terms we'll come across in a bit. Um, which kind of lets you deprivilege those down to their minimum privilege level. Um, and it gives you, you know, good properties for robustness and isolation and security. Hello. Breathing. <laughs> How's that? Uh, yeah, so that's, that's that. So um, guest domains. So there's, there's basically two forms of guest domain. Um, the first of which, and the, the long, most long-standing, is a para-virtualized domain or a PV domain. Uh, these have been around, that slide's all gone horribly strange, hasn't it? <laughs> uh, these have been around since, basically since the very early days, um, and the, the key thing about a power virtualized domain is that the, the guest knows that it's running virtualized and it will, rather than doing things directly with the hardware, it'll, it'll make uh, hyper calls to the hypervisor and do things in a virtualization friendly way, um, which means that they can be you know, pretty fast. Um, the, the disadvantage is, though, that you have to modify the guest kernel, and that's a lot of work and means that you have lots of patches to get upstream, and that's something we'll talk about later. Um, so a PV domain has uh, access only to para-virtualized devices, um, and how they work is you, you have a front end in, in the guest and a back end in the control domain, and they communicate with shared memory. Uh, you know, there's, a, there's a PV block protocol and a PD network protocol, and so data gets transferred to the back end, which then bridges it to a real NIC or writes it to an LVM volume or you know, does the appropriate back end type thing. Um, so we I mean, talk a little bit about driver domains. Um, so as I said earlier, you can take functionality out of DOM0 and put it into its own domain. One of the sort of easiest things you can do is to take uh, drivers out of domain0 and put them into their own uh, domain. 
So you might take your disk or your network and put them in, that, in a domain. Um, and then the guest, instead of talking to domain zero, it talks to this drive domain. Um, so you know, that's, there's good security, isolation, all that kind of good stuff there. It means that maybe if uh, you know, the, the, the drive domain doesn't have to run the same kernel even as DOM0. So maybe if you like the BSD PF firewall and you want to run that instead, but you want to keep DOM0 as Linux, then you have that option. Uh, maybe you've got a bit of a shonky driver from some vendor and you know, it crashes a lot, so you can put that in its own domain and you can restart that without having to take the whole host down, which is uh, a pretty good thing. Uh, so the other form guest domain is an HVM domain, a hardware virtual machine. Uh, and these use uh, hardware virtualization extensions, which private virtualized domains don't require, to uh, provide a complete PC emulation type virtualization. So you know, the, the guest operating system thinks it's running on a normal PC. Um, there is emulation here, so it is slower. You know, uh, mainly I.O. is pretty slow. But the advantage is that you don't need any special knowledge in the, in the guest kernel. It doesn't really need any uh, special code. Um, so for purposes of I.O. emulation, when, when the guest tries to do some I.O., we trap that in the hypervisor and we shuffle that off to what we call the device model. Um, so the device model is a process per guest domain, per HVM guest domain, which runs in your control stack. Um, and it's a QMU-based, it's basically QMU with all the CPU emulation stuff ripped out. And so j it just emulates NICs and uh, uh, PCI buses and storage controllers and what have you. Um, but there's a, another opportunity for disaggregating here. So, so what you can actually do is you can uh, take that device model and you can link it against uh, a thing called Minios, which is a little monolithic kernel that uh, runs directly as a PV guest on the hypervisor. And you can have one of those per domain, which uh, takes all of that emulation code, you know, which is uh, notoriously tricky and prone to uh, bugs. And uh, you can stick that into a, a domain which is only privileged to do things against its partner guest domain. Uh, so you know, that encapsulates that privilege uh, out of your main tool stack. Um, so I said there was two kinds of domain. There's a bit of a lie. There's actually a, a sort of a spectrum. Uh, and one of the things that we have is PV on HVM. So that's taking a standard HVM guest and giving it the ability to use several PV interfaces. Um, this has, you know, it kind of makes a match of the, the advantages of both the other types. You can have the same install experience as native with pieces like hardware. But I mean, the main thing, you know, I mean, the, 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 if, if you're not going to do any other PV to your HVM guest, the thing you really should do is uh, device drivers for your NIC and your disk. Uh, we're talking you know, gigabits a second instead of megabits a second on your, on your NIC if you use PV rather than emulated. Um, there are some other ones. You, know, you can have uh, PV interrupts, interrupts designed to avoid exits back to the hypervisor and it'll do EOIs. Um, PV spin locks means you're not spinning waiting for another CPU which isn't even running. Uh, you, know, you can actually sleep instead. Um, and so the PV on HVM gives you a bit of a, uh, an, an interesting trade-off between uh, on the spectrum between PV and HVM. Uh, interesting one of those is the memory. So on PV, uh, you would do one of the main things that you do to a parallelized guest is it drives the page tables directly. Um, now, that means that uh, page table updates are relatively expensive, but things like TLB misses are you know, native performance. Whereas if you've got nested paging, which is uh, on HVM, you have the hardware to you know, provide the uh, illusion of a, a second level of page tables, then uh, page table updates are actually pretty cheap but uh, TLBMS is very expensive, because for every level of the guest page table, you have to walk another page table in the, uh, in the second level paging. So a TLBMS can be like 24 memory accesses instead of four or something, something stupid. OK. So I mentioned uh, that for PV, you, you need to modify the, the, the guest kernel. Um, so originally, what we had was the, uh, what we call the classic Xeno Linux port. Um, which was a, a very heavily modified Linux kernel. Um, but basically, you rip out the MM uh, subsystem and you replace it with hypercalls. Um, but that gave you a compile time choice uh, for a kernel to either run on Zen or run on bare metal, um, you know, which, is, which is all fine. But for distros, it's not that great. You have to have two kernel packages. You have to have special flavors, you have, you know, extra QA. You have extra testing. And, uh, and it's confusing for your users because they need to figure out which kernel they want to do. Um, also, when someone tried to upstream this to Linux kernel, the, the kernel maintainer said no, <laughs> uh, quite rightly, I think. Um, so 
later on, uh, sort of around 2006, uh, came up with this idea for what's now called Paravert Ops. Uh, and the idea here is that you take um, sort of many abstractions that already exist inside the kernel, added some new ones in order to allow boot time selection of either to run PV or native. Um, so these are hooks in there's existing ABIs for, you know, interrupt handling. And so we plug in the Zen interrupt handler at boot time instead of the APIC interrupt handler. Uh, and we invented up ones for doing MMU updates via hypercalls instead. And they, they can get swapped out at boot time. Um, and one of the goals was that it wouldn't perform any worse on native when running with this configuration option turned on. And so there's some quite clever patching stuff in the kernel where uh, for, for hot paths, uh, take, you know, you know, basically, it's, a, it's an indirection via a function pointer. Uh, so there's a hot, uh, for, for hot paths like that, then there's actually uh, the kernel will patch into the five or nine bytes, you know, the actual instruction that, that does it, and therefore avoid a lot of this. And there's some incredibly complicated macros which avoid you know, GCC spilling registers and clobbering things that you don't want it to. Which, um, but yeah, I mean, the, the goal of running the, the no performance loss on bare metal, it, it's, it's pretty much there. Uh, so PV, uh, PV ops, Parrot ops, uh, DOMU, that, that work started around 2622, 32-bit, uh, 2624, that kind of became usable, 2627, DOMU support was completed, you know, added 64-bit, and then 3.0 is when we eventually got uh, DOM0 upstream. Um, there are some other operating systems that have been paravirtualized, NetBSD and FreeBSD are the big two that are still going today. Um, but there's also, I, I think, a Hurt port to, uh, to Zen, which, I mean, one of the sort of side effects of the, the, the PV device stuff is that you don't need drivers for your, you know, you need one set of drivers for your guests, so you're not forever porting drivers to the Hurt, you, you know, run Linux DOM0 and Hurt DOM U, and it's, it's kind of cool. All right, so that's kind of what Zen is. Um, hopefully to find some terminology that you need. Uh, so uh, let's talk about how Debian and Zen fit together and uh, you know, how, what they've been up to. Um, so Zen arrived in Debian pretty early in its life. Uh, Adam Heath packaged, well, the earliest I could find was 1.2 in, uh, in the changelog in sort of March 2004, you know, which is not long after the 1.0 release. I think that he actually had versions available quite a bit before that. Um, really, it was when version 3, Julian Danjou, uh, uploaded that in 2006, and Etch was the first release, you know, that really contains end support. Uh, it was both DOM0 and DOMU. Guido and Bastion have been maintainers since then, and uh, mainly it's Bastion these days. Um, right, so Debian is guest. So in Etch, we had a, a special kernel flavor which had these inner Linux patches applied. Um, so this means, you know, you have Linux image, well, kernel image back then, uh, with, a, with a Zen suffix. Um, Installation, um, I mean, really, a, a, a virtual machine root file system is a lot like a true root, so you would, you know, you'd use to bootstrap. Uh, unlike a true root, you do have to set up fstab, and you have to set up consoles and networking, so there's a little bit more to do than, than that. So uh, somebody, I'm assuming, I don't know who, wrote Zentools, which is a bunch of sort of scripts to help manage this. You know, they run boot, to bootstrap, they tailor the resulting file system, they help manage your LVM volumes, they... Uh, output the, the necessary config file. Um, and that's, you know, pe people still use that today. It's a really useful, quick way to deploy as end guest. Um, then in Lenny, we got our first Paravet Ops for i386. So Lenny had a 2626 kernel. Uh, so the 686 big mem uh, kernel flavor then was enabled for, for Zen support out of the box um, because 64 bit didn't arrive until 2627. So Lenny still had a classic Xeno Linux flavor, uh, which for MD64. Um, but because the standard kernel is now supported Zen, I mean, we could um, use Debian installer to install guests, uh, which kind of gives you the sort of the same experience you'd get on native, and you can precede and you can set things up the way you like. Um, although, obviously, to bootstrap and Zen tools was still available. Uh, squeeze, uh, we got Paravert Ops. So, Squeeze was 2632, I think. So, Paravert Ops for both the AMD64 and i386. Uh, we did some more work on DI, so you can install both 32-bit and 64-bit. We added Netboot, CD images, and the multi-arch uh, DVD images supported now in support Zen. So if you're, you're offline and you want to install Zen, then you can boot from one of those um, and you know, install in the normal way. Um, and again, to bootstrap and Zen tools are still available. Um, 
So for Wheezy, uh, that's a 3.2 kernel. It's a newer, more featureful Paravert Ops kernel, basically. Um, but the only other interesting thing was someone noticed that Blu-ray didn't have any Zen support on it, so we added that. Uh, all right. So as a host, I mean, so DOM0 is really just kind of a special DOM U. Um, so there's a little bit of extra code. So basically, it lagged about a release behind. So we had a, a Xena Linux flavor at Etch, as I mentioned. Uh, in Lenny, we still had a Xena Linux flavor for, um, for DOM0 usage, so a special flavor. Then in Squeeze, we switched to a Paravert Ops, but not a mainline Paravert Ops for the kernel flavor. And finally, in Wheezy, we have no more kernel flavors. Uh, and uh, the main standard kernel, uh, kernel packages are where Zen support is at. Um, because 3.2 supports DOM0 out of the box, and that was, uh, was quite an achievement for us. OK. Uh, so where are we now? Um, well, we've, we've spoken a little bit about Wheezy in the past um, section, but uh, for Wheezy, it, it, it seems pretty certain now that we're frozen, we're going to be shipping Zen 4.1, which is the current upstream stable release. Um, as I say, there's no more uh, Zen flavors. We're using the PVOps code uh, you know, throughout. Um, and that's really good. I mean, I mean, that means there's no much less overhead for the, the kernel team to, uh, to keep that stuff. It means I just fix a bug upstream, and I CC it to the stable kernel maintainers, and then you know, patches flow, and eventually Debian gets the fix, which is really nice. Um, so one other big thing that's changed in Wheezy, um, we ship uh, XCP Zappy toolstack now as part of Wheezy. Um, and if you weren't in Tomar's talk earlier, you're probably asking yourself, what, what does all this mean? All these uh, three and four letter acronyms. So XCP is a, an appliance um, vir virtualization solution, uh, <laughs> which it, it ships basically as a CentOS derived installation ISO, and you, you, know, you, you bung it into your machine, and you uh, hit go, and it chugs away. And that, the other side comes a, a host capable of running virtualization. And it's, it's based on CentOS. Um, and maybe I'm preaching to the choir, but I think we all know that CentOS isn't as good as Debian. And so you know, that's not really great, is it? So uh, Project Kronos, uh, some guys at Citrix uh, decided that they wanted to split out the tool stack used by XCP uh, and sort of uh, disentangle it from its uh, XCP uh, uh, roots and its CentOS roots uh, and, and make that into something that, uh, as a project, could be shipped and packaged by any distro and included. And they, they initially did their work targeting Debian. Um, we're all big fans of Debian at the Zen.org end. So. Um, and so the goal was to have the ability to apt get install XCP Zappy on Wheezy and turn Wheezy into of, you know, what looks like an XCP host, but it's running Debian and not CentOS. And I mean, that's pretty much there. I mean, that works today. Um, so uh, I guess I should big up Mike McClurg, Thomas Goran, and Rishesh Raj Sharaf, who did a lot of the work on this. Um, John Ludlam as well. Um, now, you might be asking yourself, well, why, why would we want this? Um, so uh, Zappy, which is the tool stack uh, in question, it supports a uh, XML RPC interface, quite a rich, sort of powerful management interface for Zen hosts. Um, and it was designed to be pretty programmable, and there's bindings for lots of languages. And that API is the preferred API for various cloud management stacks. So OpenStack, CloudStack, uh, Open Nebula, I think, uses it. Um, and so I mean, there are other uh, cloud management layers. You know, um, you're going to hear about Gennady later, which I think doesn't use this interface. It goes at the, uh, the lower level uh, interfaces. But um, th there's plenty of. Uh, tool stacks there that use this interface. And so by supporting this in Debian, it means that you know, not only can Debian be a, uh, a good Zen hosting uh, platform, actually it turns it into a, a really useful thing for your cloud infrastructure. Yeah, and, and building completely free cloud infrastructure, I think, is you know, something to strive for. Um, so the future, um, that's kind of where we are today. What, what's happening? Uh, you know, as we as we freeze and freeze and freeze some more for uh, Wheezy, and then what's going to happen in the next release? Hypervisor-wise, um, continuing to track upstream releases in SID. Um, the 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 package Zen project on Alioth has 4.2, you know, snapshots in it. Uh, I don't think they've been uploaded even to experimental. Um, going forward, we, uh, upstream, we're just starting to think about the Zen 4.3 release. There's a, a going to be a Zen summit in late August, uh, co-located with LinuxCon and LPC and 
Kernel Summit, and everyone's kind of descending on San Diego in, in late August. So if you're there and you're interested in Zen, then uh, you know you should come along. Um, one of the big things that's happening, sort of from 4.2 onwards upstream, is the transition from the old Zen D tool stack, which is well, it's frankly it's an unmaintainable mess, and no one wants to go near it. So uh, we've uh, been working on a replacement tool stack for that, um, sort of nice clean architecture to. Uh, uh, well, so that we can maintain it. If you look in the uh, Debian bug tracker, you'll find that look, there are tons of bugs again. So there are really Zendy bugs, and there's sort of nowhere to send them because nobody wants to maintain it upstream or in Debian. So hopefully by having something that's maintainable uh, as a, that tool stack will uh, I hope those, allow those sorts of uh, patches to get fixed. Um, yeah, in the future, better documentation. Yeah, it's always something that <laughs> everyone wants, and uh, very rarely do you get. Um, there's a pretty good wiki page on Debian. Uh, the, the, the Zen wiki has a category of uh, Debian-related stuff, you know, how to install a host, how to install a guest of this type, how to, how to do this, how to do that. And upstream have regular document days. Uh, so that's the, the last Monday of every month. We all uh, down tools on our uh, compilers and uh, edit wikis for a day and make quite a lot of progress that way. It's surprising. Uh, kernels, so, I mean, all that really to say about kernels, upstream, uh, we get a lot of support from upstream now, so there's not really anything special and no special flavors and less work for everybody. Um, there are some other kernels in Debian that I think have PV support um, and, and like, I'm fairly sure K3BSD does. And so, I mean, if there's anybody who's interested in that or the herd, you know, making that stuff work well in Debian, then that's something I'd be really keen to talk to you about. I think that'd be really cool. Uh, So Zappy, um, so the XCP Zappy thing, I mean, that works today. Um, it, it's quite a new project, it, you know, it's uh, un, unwinding it from its uh, history is, is still ongoing. Uh, I think everybody would encourage you to try it and report bugs, um, usual way, report bug or package then develop on alley off. Um, there's also, there's an upstream wiki page on sort of the, the sorts of information that is useful in these kind of bugs. Um, going forward, there's, there's more work I think, to be done to separate Zappy a little bit more from XCP and integrate it a bit better with Debian. I believe there are some limitations of the current thing. Um, so, that, you know, there's, there's certainly plenty of work to go on there, and I bet Tom R would love if you were to come and talk to him and uh, offer to help out and uh, what have you. Right, so guest support. So something I personally want to work on is uh, integrating PVHVM support into the installer. Uh, so with... Uh, Squeeze and uh, Wheezy. You can you can do an install as an HVM guest from the usual media, and then you can kind of mess around and install special kernels and uh, tweak stuff a bit and uh, get yourself a PVHVM you know on reboot. It's it's all made quite easily. You know we default to using UUID based mounting and things. So the fact that your device names change under your feet doesn't cause as much trouble as you might imagine. Um, in fact, I think this by coincidence works with the Wheezy AMD64 today. It's just kind of a side effect of the private ops thing. Uh, it just needs sort of uh, tidying up and the rough edges filing off and made, you know, very automatic. Um, and I wanted to, you know, as I say, there's, there's trade-offs between PV and PVHVM. So depending on your workload, you might want one, you might want the other, and we should try and make, uh, make both available to our users, I think. Um, so there's another interesting thing coming in the pipeline from upstream is what we call hybrid guests. So if I describe PVHVM as adding PV features to HVM guests, then hybrid is kind of coming at it from the other end. It's to take a PV guest and enable the use of more hardware features to, uh, to again, to get a good mix of, you know, the best of both worlds. Um, the reason this is uh, interesting compared with PVHVM is it means you take QMU completely out of the picture and you take emulation completely out of the picture. Um, and, you know, that's removing a whole lot of code, um, which is always good. Um, there's been some initial prototypes for running hybrid as both uh, DOM0 and DOMU. I expect that would land in 4.3, which ought to mean it to be ready in time for Wheezy plus one. Uh, so disaggregation. Um, there's, there's a lot of room for, I mean, essentially Debian does none of this today, so you know, there's always room for improvement. Um, I think a really easy one would be a, a, to, to make it much, more, much easier to, to do a, a network drive to make with Debian. You know, if you could install a Debian VM, you could, uh, app get installed Zen network backend or something and, and you know 
fettle around a little bit inside your DOM zero to, to make it use start that instead of IF up B zero. And you know, that's kind of it and it's there. And uh, you know. Um, bit of a harder problem if you're talking about storage. Uh, obviously booting from a thing that you want to actually shove later on into a driver main is pretty tricky. You can, you, you know. uh, but by no means impossible. Um, and you know, these sorts of things generally could run from RAM for the most part. So we have in it random first generators. Maybe that's an interesting uh, avenue way to approach that in the future. Um, a more difficult problem is the Minios uh, based stuff domains. So Minios is this uh, monolithic single application kernel uh, that we use. It's, it's Minios plus new lib plus the application get linked to one, one blob and run in a single address space kernel mode uh, thing. Um, which doesn't really fit into the sort of the usual distro model. Um, so I don't really know how to approach this. If anyone has any good ideas on, you know, maybe multi-arch, you know, we talk about partial architectures. You'd be talking about, you know, maybe what you might call a Pico port, half a dozen libraries able to link QMU against, uh, you know, just uh, in a cross buildy kind of way. Maybe, I don't know. It's, uh, yeah, if you have any uh, smart or cunning ideas about that, then I'm very much all ears. Okay, um, the other new thing we've got coming upstream uh, is we have an ongoing new port to the ARM. Uh, so the, the new, you know, there have been ARM uh, PV ports in the past, but the, here we're targeting uh, the new virtualization extensions which ARM have announced for the V7 uh, architecture and going forward the V8 stuff that Steve was talking about yesterday. Um, so currently, I don't think you can buy one of these. I've had some leads this weekend, uh, this week about maybe places where I could find one. But currently, we're targeting the fast model emulator, which Steve demoed yesterday. Uh, the, the V7 fast model is actually pretty fast and quite usable. Um, uh, but you know, eventually, we're going to be targeting the Cortex uh, A15. Um, and so, because these processes have virtualization from the beginning, we're, we're kind of going directly to the hybrid style thing. Um, one of the big problems getting uh, Zen code into the Linux upstream kernel was the MMU stuff. So the fact that we've got nested paging available uh, in, the, in the process from day one means you kind of skip that whole, whole section. Uh, it was lucky that when we started doing this, Linux was just really busy discovering that really uh, all these multiple kernel images were a pain. <laughs> and so they, you know, they, they've been moving to Vice Tree, and we, we figured that you know, we ought to learn a lesson from that and try and get things right, uh, right from the beginning. Um, so just before I was uh, coming away, we booted our first guest um, from a PV disk to a console, which was you know, quite exciting. Um, there's, there's still lots to do, <laughs> still lots to clean up and, and what have you. Um, but I, I kind of hope we can get this done upstream and in time to, to hit Wheezy plus one. Um, you know, Debian's a long history of good ARM ports and it's got a long history of you know, good support for Zen, so it seems like a bit of a no-brainer to me. Um, I think in the short term, Mostly that's going to be upstream work. Uh, Zendevel will be the place to come or, you know, come and speak to me later. I'm particularly interested if anyone knows much about UFI and that sort of thing on ARM and uh, what's going on there and how we're going to boot these things and all that good stuff. Um, yeah, so hopefully you've seen, you know, Debian has been uh, an excellent distribution if you're interested in Zen. It's been one of the most consistent in terms of its support for Zen over the years and uh, it's had a pretty good story. Um, but also, I think there's a, there's a good opportunity for us here to become you know, a really uh, a leading cloud infrastructure operating system. You know, there's, a, there's a hole there that, that, that Debian could fill really well, and it's, you know, uh, Debian's really good in the data center, and there's no reason why it couldn't be an excellent choice for the cloud as well. Um, but plenty of other interesting stuff. If there's any, any other projects I talked about, I'm more than happy to wax lyrical. Uh, uh, so that's it. Here's some places where people hang out, and sort of in uh, Debian and Zenland, where you know if you want to come for a chat or ask questions or whatever, uh, you can either do that now or you can come find us in many of those places. So, any questions? Hello. We have one question from IRC from yeah. Indy. Um, have you used the Zen Remus high availability system recently? And if you think it could be supported in Wizzy Plus One? Uh, so, for those who don't know, Remus is a high availability um, project based on Zen from uh, University of British Columbia. A couple of guys there, um, and it's basically it's, it's rolling checkpoints, um, 
checkpoint. So you, you, you're doing continuous live migration of the guest to a, a remote site, and you, you fence the uh, externally visible I.O. So you, you, don't, you don't commit disk or transmit network packets until the, the checkpoint has been acknowledged. Um, so if, if your site goes down, then the other site can come up. Um, and so the, the question is, have I ever used it? Uh, the answer is, I think I've run it once um, when we integrated the patches for it into the new tool stack. Uh, at the moment, I think I would say it's sort of proof of concept in the new tool stack. It, it's been well supported in Zendy for, for quite a while. It's not in itself a complete solution. You need to build a sort of an HA um, failover and you know, election system around it to, to actually do the actual failover in a safe way. You, know, you need to make sure that you've you really have died at the source before you start doing stuff at the destination. But yeah, I mean, I think Wheezy plus one would be eminently doable. For, yeah. Anybody else? There's another one on IC. Uh, another question from Demon Keeper. Um, with Zen 4.2 raising and thus uh, Zen D seizing, what's the future of Zenapi? Is there an Excel transition planned in the works? What's the feature of what, sorry? Uh, Zen D seizing. Zen D. Uh, so Zen D, I mean, it's effectively unmaintained. If someone wanted to step up and maintain it, then, you know, I guess we'd be happy for them to do so. Uh, it's, it's truly horrible internally. It's kind of been. Uh, it started off as a twisted thing, then it got untwistified, it got, uh, then it got this XML LPC thing and it kind of got half turned inside out and then that guy wandered off and so maintenance wise it's not ideal. So 4.2, so XL is a command line compatible replacement for the XM, so if you have a script that says XM create or whatever then you should be able to write XL create and we would consider it a bug if you couldn't, so it should be fairly easy to, sorry? Almost, yeah, it's, so it's nearly there. More of this in my talk about compatibility nightmares, which will be up next. Yes, so Ian has got some stuff to say about this later. Um, so there is, so there is an initial version of Excel going to be in Wheezy, um, which doesn't quite meet these goals, and it's not yet the default upstream, and it's not yet the default in the packaging. But you can switch to it and use it, and it's, I don't know, maybe it's 80% compatible rather than the 90 odd we're aiming for. Um, but I would think that upstream for 4.3 will have uh, you know, sort of completed that transition. So the question that was relayed from IRC was actually about Xen API, not Xen D. Xen API? Yeah. Ah, okay. So um, Xen D supported an initial version of the uh, Xen API interface, uh, but never particularly well, and it's not really been maintained for several years. Zappy, on the other hand, has been. You know, that is the maintained, supported, useful way to get a Zen API remote protocol. So basically Zendy is sort of like a 0 point something version and Zappy these days is the, is the 2.0, 3.0 thing. Yeah. So uh, if the, you said Excel is almost compatible with XM, so it should be. what's not there? Um, so the big thing that's missing deliberately uh, is support for Zendy's managed domains. So there's, Zendy kind of supported two, two ways of creating a domain. There was this idea of XM create, where you just give it a config file and this thing comes into being, and when you destroy it, it's gone and it's kind of ephemeral. So you keep its disks. But it also had this idea of XM new, where you, you kind of introduce the domain and, and, and it then has a life cycle and you can start, stop. Um, and so that's gone. Uh, there are other ways of doing this. There's, there's actually an init script that runs that sort of does a, a pretty good effort you know, of, of starting domains at start of day, which is. For some people, that's all they want out of managed domains. Um, Zappy is really the excellent option for that. If, if you want that kind of functionality, I'd recommend that. If you're so inclined, then Libvirt and the associated tools do a similar thing, and they, they support Zen. So Libvirt is Red Hat's yeah, management stack. Will there be a wrapper so that when, you, when we use XM, then it calls XL instead? Because that would be a very good way to keep So I think Bastion has made a wrapper now in Wheezy I think it's just called Zen rather than XM or XL that will call the appropriate tool stack at the appropriate time. Um, and you can kind of configure that under et cetera, default Zen, which, which tool stack you want to use. Um, and you know, in Wheezy plus one, I should imagine the default backing up that script would turn to XL from XM. And yeah, with time, Zendy will eventually die and be removed upstream. 
you could also make a symlink or run sed on your script. <laughs> Hello. So, so you just touched upon libvirt but didn't really mention it in the rest of the talk. Um, I realized that, that as I said it, yeah. Is that because it's a Red Hat thing and more tied to KVM, or is there any commitment from Zen uh, to actually be involved in making sure libvirt works well with Zen? So one of the big upstream contributors are Suze Novell, um, and they have a bunch of guys working on a, uh, an Excel backend for libvirt. So one thing I didn't mention is that Excel is kind of a tool stack, but there's, a, there's this thing called libxl, which is a, a library for writing tool stacks. And so we're, the intention is that Zappy will use it, and Excel will use it, and libvirt will use it as their kind of back end. Because at the moment with Zappy, there's a bunch of duplicated code for building a domain and migrating a domain, and this, you know, that's, that should be the same stuff. Uh, so that's the target there, is for libxl to be, and this is something Ian will be talking about in his talk later, is kind of that interface. Is that what Ian was going to say, or do you have another point? So one of the things we've been doing in 4.2, Zen 4.2, is making some significant improvements to the infrastructure in that libxl library with the view of libvirt as a, one of the main consumers of that. So certainly in upstream, I think it, it's fair to say that upstream are much, upstream Zen are much keener on libvirt than Debian is. Um, we see it as a, you know, certainly another way that people can use Zen and we have no intention of deprecating it or anything. Yeah, so I mean, the, so libxl in, in the 4.2 release, we're committing to keeping that API stable, so almost precisely so that people like libvirt can continue to consume it as, as time goes on. And as Ian says, there's a whole bunch of infrastructure in libxl to do event-driven tool stacks, which, I mean, if you look at the libvirt event driving thing and the xl, it's, it's, you know, they're designed to fit together in a couple of thin shim functions. Any other questions? It looks like we have only a couple more minutes. Nope. All right. Well, thanks very much. Thank you.